feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now. Nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the uh, Yonglu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar at the National University of Singapore. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you may have heard that I am losing my voice right now, so I'm going to do my best with the show. I'm also coming to you from uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm sure all of you have been there before, uh, but if you haven't, it's uh, in the American South, and my southern accent might come back if I'm not careful, so I'll try to keep it to my the, the accent I lost rather than the one I had when I was growing up. Uh, to, we have Jonathan Croston here later in the show, and we're excited to hear his talk. I'll introduce him in a minute. Please use the Q&A function and all attendees, uh, uh, sorry, the Q&A function to ask questions. And we have Shoping here to deal with the questions a little bit later. Uh, a PhD student in our Healthy Longevity program, uh, Wei Han, We'll be talking to you first about using network analysis to deconvolve healthy longevity pathways. Oh, thank you for your kind introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Wihan, and I'm a first year PhD student in Professor Brian Kennedy's labs. So today, my part topic will be is my first project in my lab, which is the deconvoluting healthy longevity pathways with network analysis. So what is the biological networks and why do we study for aging? Biological networks are the representations of the interactions or relationships between different biological entities within a cell or larger biological systems. So these entities can include genes, proteins, metabolites, and lipids. These biological processes together form this highly interconnected networks. In this figure, you can see a raw depiction of the biological network of interactions between proteins, which is usually called uh, signal transductions. During the aging, the biological networks accumulate damage, which causes alterations in gene expression, protein-protein interactions, metabolics, and signal transductions. These changes can lead to a decrease in the robustness and stability of the network making it more susceptible to perturbations and leading to a phenotypic change associated with aging. So let's take a look at the famous cellular pathways as an example. The most promising way to extend the lifespan so far is calorie restrictions, which is directly lowers the metabolic rate of your body and reduce the damage accumulations. For years, People have tried to develop drugs that can target the nutrient sensing pathways, which can mimic the effect of calorie restrictions. One of the pathways that people focus on is the insulin IGF-1 pathway. Here is a scheme of how food abundance and nutrient sensing in, and insulin can induce the metabolism rate. Two of the most famous anti-aging uh, anti drugs so far, metformin and rapamycin, target these pathways and lead to the lower metabolisms, which will lead to the anti-aging effect. In this diagram, we can clearly see how rapamycin and metformin target the upstream factors of metabolism and leading to the lower level of metabolism and healthy aging. But in reality, things are much more complicated. Firstly, because of the presence of the biological networks, 
there are alternative pathways leading to the increase in the metabolic rate. In here, we can see the arrows leaking nutrients but, but abundance directly to, meta to metabolism and AKT directly to metabolism. These indicate the pathways that activate metabolism, which are independent to the, the target of rapamycin. And also, there will be presence of the feedback loops, which is going to buffer the effect of the upstream factors. In here, we can see the metabolism itself will go back to inactivate AMPK. So this will cause from a feedback loop and cause the effect of rapamycin much less. So because of the, this complexity of the biological networks, the effect of single anti-aging interactions can be often limited. So this will be the focus of my research. First of all, can we find the anti-aging drug targets that are critical for the aging process and its activity is not easily limited by biological networks? And secondly, can we use drug combinations instead of single drug targets to target multiple part of the aging network to enhance the anti-aging effect. So here I will use the integration of an analysis of large RNA-seq data to construct co-expression networks. And this net, from these networks, we can find the modules that are associated with an, a healthy and longevity. And then we're going to calculate the impact of the drugs on modules and predict to predict the drug synergies. And finally, we're going to validate our predicted drug synergy with model organisms such as C. elegans. And if it works, we can even extend it further to higher model organisms such as mice. And this is my presentations today. I'll give special thanks to Professor Brian Kennedy and Professor Yan Growers. And also I'll give special thanks to all my colleagues and lab mates who helped me during my research. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We're looking forward to see what the network analysis uh, spits out. It's going to be, uh, Wei Han's doing a lot of cool work. Um, Jonathan is a professor of ophthalmology at the Safe Site Institute at the University of Sydney. He manages patients with complex glaucoma and researches the role of aging on optic nerve resilience in glaucoma. In 2006, he moved to Australia and served as head of ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne until 2018. And subsequently, head of the newly formed Center for Vision Research at Duke in US here in Singapore. The title of his talk today is gonna to be Aging, Exercise and Neuro Recovery in the Optic Nerve. Thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Brian. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. I, um, I've watched a number of the episodes of the webinar and there've been some fantastic lectures and uh, it's a real honor to be here to be talking to you tonight. So I'm gonna to talk today about aging, exercise and neuro recovery, uh, mainly of the optic nerve, but I think this may apply to other nerves of the central neuro nervous system. So um, I'll really divide this talk into three parts. My, my group has been really trying to understand why aging predisposes to age-related neurodegeneration in, in, in the optic nerve. And the three uh, parts of this lecture will be a quick outline of glaucoma, then to show you some experimental data showing the impact of advancing age on neuro recovery and how this might be modified by lifestyle interventions. And then finally, some clinical data that we now got a couple of years ago uh, to show visual recovery in response to a, a neuroprotectant. So glaucoma is a age-related neurodegenerative disease. Um, it impacts specifically the neurons that transmit the visual signal from the retina back through to the brain. And on the left-hand side here, you can see the, the, the optic nerve in this cartoon. And the retinal ganglion cells, which are the cells that die, are stimulated by photoreceptors, which are activated by, by light, which pass the signal onto bipolar cells, which in turn um, uh, stimulate uh, retinal ganglion cells to induce action potentials, which are transmitted back through the optic nerve. And what happens in glaucoma is that you get an accelerated loss of these neurons for a number of different reasons. And in fact, glaucoma probably represents a multitude of different diseases. The end phenotype of optic nerve damage manifests by thinning of the neuroretinal rim that you can see on the right-hand side here in the optic nerve. Um, photograph with a little hemorrhage inferiorly, um, also associated with progression of visual field loss. And in fact, glaucoma is now the leading cause globally of irreversible uh, blindness. 
So there are a number of reasons why the optic nerve or retinal ganglion cells may die in glaucoma. We know that it's strongly associated with elevation of intraocular pressure, which induces biomechanical stresses on, on the axon. But a number of other uh, mechanisms likely play a role in different types of glaucoma, including circulatory abnormalities, changes in the immune system, as well as uh, glial cells that may contribute to neuronal loss. The question really we've been asking is not why do ganglion cells die, but what prevents them from, from dying? And, and relatively little work has been done in this space. And in particular, we wanted to know whether any lifestyle interventions were able to increase resilience of retinal ganglion cells in patients at risk of glaucoma. Now, it's important to say that retinal ganglion cells are one of the most metabolically active uh, cells in the body. And we believe that in, with aging and in glaucoma, they become metabolically challenged. On the left-hand side, here you see a standard cartoon of a retinal ganglion cell. In fact, what they really look like is, is this. They've got extremely long axons. And this is one of the reasons why they require uh, so much energy. A second reason is that the intraocular portion of the retinal ganglion cells are unmyelinated. The optic nerve only becomes myelinated once it's exited the optic nerve. And so a second reason why there's such a high metabolic demand. We, a number of years ago, together with, with Ian Trance, um, showed a complex one defect in a, a majority of patients with uh, open angle, a minority of patients with open angle glaucoma. And you can see here on the, on the right hand panel this reduction in ATP production, maximum ATP synthesis in response to complex one substrates in two glaucoma uh, populations. Okay, so one of the advantages that we have, and one of the, 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 the things I think that neuroscience could benefit from looking into the eyes is that we were able to accurately phenotype the optic nerve, both structurally and on the top hand row, you see a series of, of uh, optic nerve photographs showing progressive thinning of the neuroretinal rim. We also conduct other imaging modalities, and here you see a series of OCT scans, and you can see this, this darker wedge-shaped defect that enlarges over time in this patient who is progressing. And you can see in the bottom here some beautiful image of some high-resolution uh, OCT, where we now get an axial resolution of around about three microns. On the right-hand vertical, you see again a patient who's progressing, but this time being monitored by, by visual field progressing progression. So we're very fortunate to be able to accurately phenotype both the structure and function of the optic nerve. Now, currently treatment for glaucoma is limited to lowering of intraocular pressure. And we can do this with a number of different modalities not relevant to this, le this lecture. But what is relevant is that we currently in the clinic do not have any treatments that actually directly target the neurons that die in glaucoma and increase the resilience of, of the optic nerve. And this is something that we would be very interested in, in, in trying to, to, to generate. Now, the two major risk factors for glaucoma are advancing age and elevated intraocular pressure. And you can see on the left-hand panel here, the data from a number of population studies showing this near exponential increase in the prevalence of glaucoma with increasing age. Intraocular pressure elevation is associated with increased uh, frequency of glaucoma. However, a large number of patients can still develop glaucoma in the presence of population normal intraocular pressures. And this is perhaps something we can talk about later if people are, uh, are interested in, in why that may be the case. So in order to look at the effect of advancing age and intraocular pressure elevation uh, on, on an organism, we uh, developed a, a model in the mouse eye where we cannulate one eye with an anesthetized mouse uh, with a very fine 50 micron needle and elevate the intraocular pressure to 50 millimeters of mercury. And at this pressure, we're able to selectively reduce the function of retinal ganglion cells in the inner retina. And we were able to subsequently, after the injury, monitor uh, a mouse for up to 28 days with an electroretinogram. This is a non-invasive way of monitoring the function of the entire retinin. Different waveforms uh, denote the activity of different layers of the retina, with the A wave telling us what the photoreceptors are doing, the B wave, the middle bipolar cells. And the scotopic threshold response in mice is very good at telling us what the retinal ganglion cells uh, are, are doing. And here you see the, the different waveforms, the photopic negative response is the hue is an equivalent uh, waveform that's derived from the inner retina largely from retinal ganglion cells and a waveform that is more robust in humans uh, as opposed to the str which is the waveform most robust in 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 the mouse eye so we measure uh, retinal function in response to a short-term, a highly reproducible intraocular pressure challenge. And here you see the, 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 the graph, the, uh, the inner retinal function, the positive scotopic threshold response mapped against time 
in response to a 30 minute injury, um, which is a standard injury that we use. And what we and here we compared uh, three month old animals with middle aged 12 month old animals. And what you see is that the young animals recover, lose function at day three, and then recover function nearly normal levels by day seven. And this is maintained up to day 28. In contrast, even middle aged mice uh, develop a similar loss of function, but take much longer in order to regain function. And although they, they gain near normal function, there's always a, a about a 10% uh, residual deficit uh, on recovery in the 12 month old animals. And this was interesting data because it showed us that um, the, the, inner retinal, the inner retina can lose function for quite a period of time before recovering it. On the right-hand side, you see the A and B wave, which denote outer and middle retina. And you can see that in this injury model, they are not impacted uh, by, by the injury. And the reason we like this model is because we believe it gives us three different populations of retinal ganglion cells. In green here, the healthy, uh, untouched retinal ganglion cells. In red, injured retinal ganglion cells that are no longer functioning properly. And then in orange, the recovered retinal ganglion cells that have regained the responsiveness to light. But the question is, are they uh, fully recovered? So as I mentioned, we, we now believe that retinal ganglion cells can recover function after prolonged periods of, of dysfunction. And this goes against the mantra that in glaucoma, healthy retinal ganglion cells are exposed to an injury that leads to their death. We believe there exists this middle state where ganglion cells are alive and recoverable um, and, and that this recovery process is is, is potentially a highly modifiable. And we call these cells comatose cells and a little bit tongue in cheek, but perhaps this is the, uh, the coma in, in glaucoma. And if you're interested, we wrote a review article a number of years back to, to cover our thinking. So the next question is, what do we really mean when we say that these retinal ganglion cells are, are dysfunctioning, not functioning properly? And I'm not going to, because of the time limits here, not going to go through this into great detail, but this is work that we did in collaboration with Steve Petro at the Flory Institute in, in Melbourne, and, and Eamon Fahey in Savannah, and, and Lewis Fry did a lot of work here, really taking uh, retinas out of injured animals at different time points, creating flat mounts, and then patching the cells and then sticking and filling them to look at structural change. And to cut a long story short, I'm not gonna show you the data, what we found was that young mice recover in a different way to older mice. Whereas young mice recover their excitatory inputs over time, uh, older mice become intrinsically more excitable, but do not recover their excitatory inputs. So suggesting that young and middle-aged mice recover from an exactly the same injury in, in different, different ways. And this is something we're preparing currently for, for, for publication. So why is this important? Well, the real question is what happens then if we re-challenge uh, retinal ganglion cells that have already been injured but been allowed to, to, to recover? So we set up a second series of experiments where we uh, expose three and 12 month old mice to a, a single challenge. We allow them to recover uh, and then we hit them with a second challenge. And this gave us some very interesting results. These are the data from, from three months from younger animals. And what you see here is, as I showed you, full recovery by day seven. But if you hit them a second time with exactly the same second injury, they lose function to a similar extent, but just take a little bit longer to recover. When we repeat the same injury in, in older animals, what we see, however, is that following that second injury, there is no recovery. Furthermore, what we see is that a larger number of retinal ganglion cells die in the older animals after the second injury. And this was not the case in the young animals. I'm not showing you that data. But also importantly, what we see for the first time in our model system is that the axons also become damaged. These are visual evoked potentials, which tell us how well the, the optic nerve is conducting. And what we see is, is, is a reduction in amplitude and a delay in signal trans transduction across the axon. And when we grade these axons, what we see in the young animals is no evidence of, of, of damage, but in the older animals, this second injury leads to, to, to significant damage uh, of, the, uh, of the axons of the retinal ganglion cells. So we believe that this, this, this different mechanisms of recovery, uh, particularly the loss of excitatory inputs in the older animals, predispose them to uh, a worse outcome when they are rechallenged. So that's as much as the, the, the model that I'm going to talk about today. But the, the really the interesting question is, well, can we recover the way that older animals uh, recover following uh, this intraocular pressure challenge? And we became 
quite interested in, in exercise from a, a relatively uh, early time. This is from a, a, a paper a number of years back from 2008 from uh, Lautenschlager in, in Melbourne, who showed an improvement in cognitive uh, function in early Alzheimer's patients in response to walking uh, three times a week. And since then, there's been a lot of data looking at the impact of, of exercise uh, on uh, cognitive decline, and a number of lecturers have previously touched on this. I'm not going to talk any more about that, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the impact of exercise on, on the retina. Our interest was piqued by their study from, from Berkeley, where they questioned 30,000 runners in running clubs from across America. And they looked at the self-reported rate of glaucoma in these individuals over a seven year period. And what they found was that the further the runners ran and the faster they had their 10 kilometer time, the less likely they were to get incident glaucoma. So again, this suggested that exercise may be protecting uh, individuals who are predisposed to glaucoma uh, from, from getting the, the, the disease. To compound this, there's also accumulating evidence that patients with uh, causes of visual impairment also conduct less habitual exercise. And this is data from Hopkins uh, on a glaucoma uh, population by Pradeep Bramilu, who showed that patients with mild or severe glaucoma uh, do perform uh, fewer daily steps than patients without glaucoma. And likely, likewise, the, the number of minutes of vigorous activity is significantly reduced in individuals with severe glaucoma. So exercise on the one hand protects the optic nerve, but a reduction in exercise associated with visual impairment may actually predispose individuals to, to worse glaucoma. So we of course naturally ask the question, well, what about exercise in our model? And we've been exercising mice now for a number of years, either by swimming them uh, in, in 35 degrees, and you can see some, some mice swimming here, they're natural swimmers in the, in, in the wild, or we run them on, on, on running wheels, uh, which allows, which is a more, a more voluntary form uh, of exercise. So what happened when we take 12-month-old uh, animals uh, and, and hit them with the same, same injury? And here you go, uh, the, again, the similar time chart to the one I showed you before, um, at three months of age in, in the black, uh, circles, we see this loss of function and regain a function that you've already seen. The non-exercise 12-month-olds recover function slowly, as you've already seen. But when we exercise these 12-month-old animals, and these are animals that where the exercise was started 24 hours after the injury, we see that they recover much better than the older animals. In fact, they seem to almost completely turn back the clock and they recover just as well as uh, three-month-old animals. So exercise seems to improve the ability uh, of retinal ganglion cells to recover. Important question, does it stop, stop retinal ganglion cells from dying? And you see here on the right-hand panel um, that it does appear to reduce the amount of retinal ganglion cell loss, at least after the first injury. We haven't looked at this in response to the, the second injury in detail. Now, exercise was also associated with a reduction in neuroinflammation. Here you see astrocyte activation in exercise animals, much less than in age-matched non-exercise animals, as well as microglial activation and proliferation reduced in animals that have been uh, exercised after injury. We see less loss of excitatory synapses. Here you see the non-injured animals, and here you see the injured, the injured exercised animals with, with almost baseline levels of excitatory synapses. And this is associated with a, a reduction in, in complement activation, which we believe is, is, is responsible for, for synapse elimination um, following injury. So what are the mechanisms by which exercise is protecting the, 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 the retina? Uh, we did a number of targeted studies here. Uh, this is some, some data looking at um, inhibiting uh, two candidates that we were interested in. Firstly, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, and these are animals that are exercised in the presence or absence of a TREK-B, the cognate receptor for, for BDNF, in the presence or absence of a, a TREK-B receptor antagonist. And what you see here in the white column are exercised animals that have recovered uh, pretty much normally after uh, the, the after the injury. However, in the presence of a BDNF receptor antagonist, it would completely abrogate the effect of exercise. And in fact, it was so clean that we didn't believe the data and have repeated this a number of times. And again, in, in the presence of a of BDNF receptor blockade, we see no protection at all from, from the exercise. We then went on to look at a BDNF heterozygote uh, knockout. The, the homozygotes are, are, are lethal, uh, but in the heterozygote knockout, again, we see this, this very dramatic response where exercise no longer protects these animals. So BDNF uh, signaling appears to be critical for the protective effect 
of, of exercise. We looked at other candidates, particularly uh, AMPK, and this was with an AMPK beta one knockout and AMPK beta one, beta two muscle specific knockout. And again, even though these animals had impaired exercise ability, they were barely able to run on, on, on the, on the uh, running wheels, but they were able to swim, uh, albeit at less vigorously than the, the wild type animals. But even they had, even though they had reduced exercise ability, they were still a uh, well protected uh, following exercise. So AMPK, at least in our in our model, doesn't appear to be playing an important role. And the next question was, does exercise protect against repeat IP challenge? And uh, it's going to show you the the these are for twelve month old animals, and you've already seen that they don't recover following the second injury. But if you start exercising them after the second injury, we do see some, some, some recovery. And this is probably better shown if you superimpose the, the second recoveries. Uh, these are the non-exercise and these are the exercise animals. So uh, exercise does uh, improve outcomes following the, the, the second injury. Also reduces uh, retinal ganglion cell death following a second injury and restores the conductance, conductance of, the, of the retinal ganglion cell axons. So exercise, improves recovery following a single injury and reduces the amount of neuronal degeneration after a second injury. So it's a very powerful effect. In fact, we haven't been able to mimic uh, this protection, this level of protection with any other interventions that we've tried. We're now looking further into the, the underlying mechanisms and Cat Bell is taking over this uh, and performing a lot of single cell RNAC and some metabolomic analysis now. And hopefully we'll, we'll get down to some of the, the, the pathways that are regulate, regulating uh, BDNF signaling in the, in the retina in response to exercise. So that's the, the mouse data I'm going to show you. Now, just in the last five minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the human uh, work that we've been doing. Uh, we've been interested, as I, as I just told you, in neuro recovery in mice. Does this phenomenon occur in, in humans? These are some consecutive visual fields that I performed in a tennis coach who had bad glaucoma and had a reproducible visual field defect, who I performed glaucoma surgery on back in 2008 and then followed him for a number of years after that. And you can see that this reproducible visual field defect almost cleared completely in this individual, even though structurally the nerve remained markedly glaucomatous, suggesting that at least some individuals can recover function. This is a large series. This video is a large series that not actually there. You can see some movement. Um, moving these, these, each dot here represents a, a, an eye of a patient. These are 300,000 patients who followed for up to 40 years. And what you see is that in general, the, the line, the dots move down to the bottom right, which sort of signifies a, a reduction or a, a loss of, of visual field. But about 50% of these dots at some stage during this follow-up period actually moved up towards the left, signifying uh, recovery of visual function. So we do believe that visual function is feasible in, in human populations. We were very keen to have the same uh, endpoints uh, available in humans as we did do in our, our mouse studies. And we've developed the photopic negative response and published a number of papers trying to improve the reproducibility of this. And this is Mark Sarossi here and, and, and Jess and Flora and Xavier who did a lot of work trying to improve our ability to measure retinal function in humans. This was one of the first studies that we did was we asked the question whether lowering intraocular pressure in glaucoma patients actually improved uh, inner retinal function. And the answer to that was it does. On the left-hand panel, you see the reduction in intraocular pressure. And then in this next panel here, you see the inner retinal function improves in patients where the intraocular pressure was brought down as compared to controls who had no change in, in, in treatment. So we do get some reversal uh, in, in vision with uh, intraocular pressure lowering, but this is well known and this has now been documented in a number of different studies. Perhaps more interestingly was, are, are there any other agents that, that are candidates that might improve visual function in glaucoma? And so we turned to nicotinamide. And the reason for this was that uh, a collaborator of ours, Pete Williams, and, and Simon John conducted a very nice study that was published in 2017 that showed that oral nicotinamide or, or NMNAT2 gene therapy, which upregulates uh, NAD levels in the retina of mice, was able to robustly protect these mice uh, from getting uh, glaucoma. And so we were very interested in translating this into, into humans. And as nicotinamide is widely available in health food stores, we conducted a, a pilot study to, to look at this. 
We became even more excited when a French group suggested that the serum nicotinamide levels in uh, glaucoma patients uh, was lower compared to age-matched non-glaucomatous controls. And so this really uh, sped us into looking at a, at a pilot study uh, where we did a crossover design where patients with, with open angle glaucoma were taken and then randomized to receiving the placebo or three grams of nicotinamide. And then after a, a three month period was switched over to receive the other treatment. So all patients received both treatments and then we conducted uh, inner retinal function measurements using visual fields or the ERG that I've just shown you um, at 6, 12, uh, 18 and 24 weeks after commencing the, the, the study. Okay, and this is the, the consort diagram. We lost about uh, four patients in, in each of the, the, the two uh, randomization uh, groups. And really this is the, the key data that we found. And what we saw was that when patients were taking nicotinamide at three months, there was a significant improvement in the inner retinal function as measured by the electroretinogram. And that is both for the Vmax, the maximum photonic negative response amplitude, as well as the, 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 the amplitude compared to the, the, the B wave amplitude. Uh, and when we look back to baseline measures, again, we saw that there was a significant improvement in inner retinal function compared to baseline in patients when they were taking uh, nicotinamide, but not when they were taking uh, not when they're taking the, the, the placebo. We also looked at visual fields and saw similar results. This here shows the percentage of patients who improve, improved or, or got worse by more than one decibel of their average visual field uh, data. And what you see under placebo, a similar number got got better and as, as, as did get worse. But when they were taking nicotinamide, a much larger proportion improved their visual field uh, compared to getting worse. And again, uh, this was all masked uh, analysis and, and quite, quite a robust finding, which we weren't expecting to be truthful. We were doing this pilot study in order to get funding to do a much bigger study. Uh, so we weren't expecting to see any, any improvement. And when we then correlated visual field improvement with the electroretinogram, we saw an association. So this suggested that, that nicotinamide uh, in its shorter period of three months can improve uh, the visual function as measured in two different ways uh, in patients with, with open angle glaucoma. And we're now conducting four large randomized controlled trials to look at the long-term outcomes. It's all very good improving vision in the short term, but we really want to know whether this improves glaucoma outcomes in the, in the longer term. So this is just to, to, to summarize, I hope I've been able to persuade you that advancing age reduces uh, retinal ganglion cell resilience to injury. Uh, and then this can be modified by the exercise or diet. And I've not showed you any of the, the, the diet data, um, but also hopefully can impress on you that the eye in rodents uh, and humans gives us a great opportunity to, to investigate aging yeah, and the effects of aging and, and injury on the, on the central nervous system. So with that, I just want to, if you're interested in optic nerve research, we run a meeting every year on the top of a mountain in Austria, uh, which has really great science. It's a relatively small meeting. Uh, and if you're interested, please, please do get in, in touch with me. I'd just like to thank our, our funders, but also the people who did all the work. This is our group in Melbourne, uh, group in Singapore, and also a, a special uh, mention to Steve Petru's group who did all the, uh, the, the, electrophysiology, the electrophysiology for us. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jonathan. You know, it's very interesting data and raises a lot of, uh, I think, uh, intriguing questions. Um, maybe we can start with a little more basics, though. Um, something that, that I don't know, so probably a lot of the audience doesn't either, is what, what controls the changes in inter-optic uh, um, pressure uh, that are such a risk factor for glaucoma? You mentioned aging driving uh, as a risk factor for glaucoma, but are those two things related to each other, or are there other events yeah. that alter pressure? There are other events that, that alter pressure. So in fact, if you look at a, a, in population studies that intraocular pressure with increasing age, in, in most populations, it does not increase with age. In fact, in some populations it actually goes down with age. So, so the, the increasing rates of glaucoma are not a result of increasing intraocular pressure. And we think it's a, it's a consequence of increasing vulnerability of the nerves to, to the pressure uh, as it is. Uh, there are a number of of reasons why the intraocular pressure can rise and in glaucoma, they're usually due to blockade of the ability of aqueous humor, the fluid in the front of the eye to escape from the eye uh, uh, through the trabecular meshwork. I see, yeah, so it's a combination of those two things. It's, uh, how, is it, how, how easy is, is it to control pressure? 
Um, we have a, we have a lot of treatments, and this is what we spend our time doing. But you know, the interesting thing is that we can control it, but with with eye drops or with laser treatments or or, or, or with surgery. Um, but you know, what we don't have for the most common cause of irreversible blindness, what we don't have is a treatment that actually alters the resilience of the of, of the of the tissue that gets damaged in the disease. And, and this is something that, that that we really do need. You mentioned that glaucoma is probably a multitude of diseases, and this is something that you hear increasingly with a range of different neurologic conditions, Alzheimer's being one of them. Uh, maybe you could comment more about that. Are there different uh, etiologies yeah. or different presentations, or how do you can you separate one from the next? There are. I mean, they they're grossly divided. We get we we classify it as open or closed angle glaucoma. Closed angle glaucoma is more common in in, in Asian populations, particularly in in, in Singapore and, and in India. Um, and in these these eyes, the intraocular pressure tends to elevate, and it's elevated intraocular pressure that tends to cause the disease. The other large group of open angle glaucomas, uh, sorry, the other group is open angle glaucomas. And they are, are essentially often have elevated intraocular pressure, but a large proportion may also manifest disease with intraocular pressures within the normal range. And we call those normal, normal tension or normal pressure uh, glaucomas. And up to about 50% in European populations can have the disease in the absence of elevated pressure. Uh, and in countries such as Japan or Korea, up to 80% of the population develops glaucoma without ever manifesting an elevated intraocular pressure. And we think that in, in these patients, they're, they're, again, they may have more vulnerable nerves and, and aging may be, may be a component of that, but there may be other genetic factors that make their, their nerves more vulnerable. You may not be able to answer this question, but does exercise differentially affect these different variants? We don't know whether exercise differentially affects. And in fact, you know, we're still lacking a, a, a well-conducted randomized controlled trial looking at exercise uh, as an intervention. Yeah. We've, we've got the a lot animal of animal models. You cannot, you, do you, does the animals, do the animals model one or another of the conditions or is it? Yeah, so the, 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 the model that we use really is not a glaucoma model. It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, yeah. it's an acute injury model, but there are forms of glaucoma that also present acutely. So angle closure can present acutely, although more commonly it presents in a, as, a, as a chronic disease. Uh -huh. You can get patients for, who, who put on steroid drops, for example, who get an acute angle closure, who, who present with, with very, very acute increases in ocular pressure. And, and it may, may better represent that, that disease. Uh, one of the things that uh, struck me is that, um, is, is there, you know, talking about the complex one uh, uh, defects in, in uh, these retinal ganglion cells, I mean, they have these long projected axons. And, and, you know, one of the challenges with neurons is that not only do you have to have the right amount of energy in the cell and the right signal transduction pathways activated, but they have to be activated in the right location too. And so um, I imagine that's a challenge with these retinal ganglion cells is that you, you can have mitochondria that are functional, but they you need to have them dispersed properly in the cells as well. Has anybody looked at changes with that with aging? Yeah, so, so people are beginning to look in, in great detail at mitochondrial dysfunction in, in glaucoma as they are in other neurodegenerative diseases. And, you know, what's interesting is the metabolic substrates also differed uh, to different compartments of the, of, of the retinal ganglion cell. So the axon may be more dependent on lactate, for example, whereas, whereas you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the soma, the, 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 it takes other, other, other substrates. Um, the the uh, complex one data was 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 interesting, and we've now verified that in in, in two two separate populations. And it's about a thirty percent of the open angle glaucoma patients that manifest this this change in complex one. And what's interesting is that Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, which is a mitochondrial optic neuropathy that that essentially blinds mainly young young, young men, has a similar end phenotype to, to glaucoma. They present in different ways, but has a similar end phenotype. And the three common labors mutations are also on the complex one gene. So complex one seems to be particularly important in, in retinal ganglion cells. It's interesting, you know, there's a lot of work on complex one and aging too. And at least in some of the simple animal models, it's like inhibitors of complex one actually extend lifespan. So it's a, um, I'm skeptical that that would be the case in people, but uh, you know, the things like metformin are proposed to be complex one inhibitors. And, uh, That's right. That's right. Actually, metformin also improved recovery in our in, in our model. I, I didn't show that that data, but the uh, 
you know, it's interesting to speculate that that may, maybe in an injury situation, you, you don't want to be producing a lot of oxidative stress and that, you know, maybe yeah. a, a glycolytic energy source may, may be something that's safer for the cell. Yeah, that's intriguing. You know, there was a, a paper by David Sinclair and colleagues about uh, cellular reprogramming in the optic nerve um, that had quite dramatic effects. I, I wonder what you thought about that paper. And do you think this is an environment in the body where you might uh, reprogramming might be a particularly effective strategy? Yeah, look, I, th- I think I think it's it's very exciting work. Obviously, it needs to be to be to be reproduced. And you know, there are a number of groups that are looking now at reprogramming in the retina, and and particularly, you know. One of the issues that we have is once you they're post mitotic cells. So once you lose your retinal ganglion cells, you can't you can't restore them. And so yeah. by reprogramming or by replacement, um, you know, but it's a huge challenge because not only do you need to essentially generate a, a new neuron, you need to get this axon to track back five five centimeters in in a human, yeah. um, all the way back into lateral geniculate. So so that there's a there's a number of significant challenges. But you know, there's some great work that's being done in a number of different groups in in rats where they're able to. To regenerate the 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 retinal ganglion cell axon all the way back to the supraclicalis in a in a rat, for example. So so I think this is you know this is not science fiction anymore, but I think there's still a long way to go. Um, I was curious about the nicotinamide studies as well. Um, you you did a crossover where you had uh, patients on nicotinamide and then taken off for three months as well. Did 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 they lose the benefit in the three month window away from nicotinamide? Yeah. They, they they did they they went they went back to 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 where they were yeah so, so the the effect seemed to be short lived that wasn't that wasn't a, one of the the primary or secondary endpoints specifically uh-huh. but but the we didn't have a washout period and so half the patients went from nicotinamide to um to, to placebo and when we looked at the the two placebo groups either first or second uh, choice then then essentially there was no difference between them so it seemed to seemed to return back to to baseline levels yeah. I guess that's what you would predict, but you know, you might you might imagine that if you restore or you know stabilize these uh, retinal ganglion cells, that the effect might persist as well. So I was just curious about that. We yeah. go ahead. Absolutely, no. We, we, we were hope, we were also hoping it would persist, but it, it seems like you probably need to to continue that. And interesting, we did, did an experiment where we in the two hit model where we exercise between the first and second hit, but then stopped um, at the second hit. Uh, and, and look to see whether you conferred uh, protection. And what we saw was the effect wore off pretty quickly within a week. We saw the the, the effect of exercise wearing off. So it doesn't seem to confer a, a prolonged effect. Yeah, there's this uh, puzzling result for longevity in mice where if you treat uh, mice for three months, uh, this has been done mostly with rapamycin, but there's suggestions it will happen with other uh, longevity interventions as well. If you treat for just three months, you you still get the longevity benefit, even if you stop giving the mice rapamycin. And uh, that's still a surprising finding, I believe. And there's a lot of debate about whether such a thing might happen in humans. And and so not enough people do these uh, switching people, switching uh, clinical study participants from the intervention back to the placebo to see if the the effect persists. So I was really interested in that result. It's really and, and you know it's a, it's a really important point because if you can essentially stop the clock for a while, you know even if you can can stop it for two or three years, that may have a massive yeah. effect on longevity and on health span. So 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 I think that, that that's very exciting that that, that data. And unfortunately, we, we couldn't reproduce that in you know with, with with our model system. But ours is an acute injury, and it may well be yeah. that in, in, in chronic scenarios that you're able to, to do that more more yeah. easily. Well, we're we're doing that in all of our intervention studies, where we have a chase period afterwards and see if the effects persist. The the hopeful effects persist. <laughs> so um, you chose nicotinamide. Have you thought about using? I know there's also a lot of debate about which NAD precursor to use. Have you compared them, or have you thought about comparing them? No, we 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 haven't. We went with that because of the in the Pete Williams science paper that that used nicotinamide, and so we uh-huh. we sent did it for that reason. But there, there is a group now in Hong Kong that's looking at the riboside. Um, and we're interested, we're interested to see um, how that goes. There's a, another yeah. group in Colombia that's combining nicotinamide with pyruvate. Uh, and they showed again that the second pilot, their, their pilot study showed some some benefit as well. So so uh-huh. I think there are, are, are now variants that are, that are being tested. That's exciting. Uh, I think one of the uh, take home points from your talk uh, that, that I found something worth reiterating, and I keep talking about this over and over again, is using age-appropriate mice. Um, You know, the the effects you see in the 12-month-old mice are probably a a, a pretty good measure of what's happening during aging. Can you do even older mice than that? 
Yeah, so, so I did, didn't show the, the data. 18-month-old mice interestingly behave a little bit more like 12-month-old mice, but they're a bit more variable. 24-month-old uh, mice don't seem to recover. But, you know, we have to give, to do these longitudinal studies, we have to give them multiple anesthetics. And so it's it's quite a, a challenging study to do. And we've looked both electrophysiologically and, and with patch clamping studies, but also with the ERG. And, and quite recently, Vicky was able, who, who does all the, she's a, a, a master at doing the ERGs, was able to show that, that we don't seem to get recovery at all in the 24 month olds. Um, but we've only done a smaller number of mice. We've done hundreds and hundreds at 12 months, but we've only done a small number of 24 months. So I didn't, didn't show that. Yeah, the, the anesthesia problem is definitely something we face too in our aging mice. It's, uh, we'd like to do a lot more invasive measurements during our aging studies, but the mice just don't respond particularly well to anesthesia at that age. So I, I understand that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, your point about aging mice is, is, is super important. And, you know, we, we hear a lot of people saying that the black six mice, which is the mice that we use, are resistant, that their retinal ganglion cells are resistant to, to dying. And, and nearly always this is in experiments where three-month-old mice were tested. And again, our, our three-month-old mice are also really resistant in our model system. It's only when they get older that you start seeing them succumbing. So, so you make a very good point. It's absolutely critical that you do age-relevant uh, animals. You'd never do a clinical study in glaucoma with 20-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mention this all the time because, you know, a lot of researchers will say that, oh, it's so expensive to use old mice. Uh, and actually, we have a budget in NUS uh, the, to provide old mice to people that want to do experiments just for this reason. Um, but they don't want to, it's costly and it takes time to use old mice. But then, you know, a young mouse and an old human is not a good transition for for, yeah. for a research project. So, and and the, and and failed studies in humans cost a lot of money too so it's uh um, yeah i think that was the, a really exciting part of your research maybe i can bring a uh, show ping and we have a a number of questions from the audience uh dear prof croston thank you so much for doing uh research in glaucoma uh this is a uh, very close to my heart because my grandma also have the the disease and it seemed very hopeless because currently there's no cure yeah, so I would like to thank you for your great effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and that there's a lot of questions from the floor. So may I start with uh asking the exercise related questions? So they they are like a question from a uh, vocal paddles and uh Praga does they ask that what type of exercise is it a cardio weight training that make a difference in the protective effect? And how long do the effect of exercise and supplement last if they discontinue. Have you tested them? So, so, so we've only looked in, in mice. We're planning now. So Cat Bell is looking at doing some human exercise intervention studies. And we're discussing with exercise physiologists what best to do. We don't know in humans yet. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly in mice, we've tried both swimming and uh, running on a running wheel. So that's involuntary and voluntary running uh, exercise. The, the mice that are swimming cannot get out, so they have to swim. So there's a stress associated with that as well. Mm -hmm. But we found similar levels of protection with both running and, and swimming. We haven't tried resistance training in the mice. I'm not, I'm not sure we can sort of how, we, how we'd actually do that in, in, in mice. Uh, and, and as I just mentioned to Brian, unfortunately, the, the effect seems to wear off uh, reasonably quickly. I think within a week or so, we see uh, exercised mice returning back to baseline if we follow them after a second injury. So the, the effect doesn't seem, at least after this acute injury, it doesn't seem to be long lasting. But the situation may be different in chronic diseases, as, as, as Brian was suggesting. For example, you know, disease associated with DNA methylation, where if you can slow that process down for, a, for an interval, you, you may get persistent or prolonged uh, benefits from that intervention. But in, in our acute model, it mm -hmm. doesn't seem... Oh, I see. Uh, thank you. So uh, the, another question is related to uh, how does, what drive uh, recovery post-injury? Uh, uh, reactive glia involved in the neurogenesis. And, yeah. and the second question is how BNDF is involved in that process of recovery? Do you have uh, any idea? They're both great questions, and we're, we're now beginning to look, we're doing some single-cell RNA-seq and beginning to look at the, the signals from, from glial cells, mm -hmm. yeah, and we think, yes, that it's quite likely that they, they play a role. They certainly show some transcriptomic changes after injury, but we, we haven't been able to look at the mechanisms yet. This is this is the ongoing analysis that, that we're doing. As far, as far as BDNF goes, we know that it's critical. 
We don't know where the BDNF is coming from. We don't know what the source of the BDNF is yet. Um, we, we know that it's not elevated by exercise in, in the inner retina. So, so, so when we do you know, standard uh, proteomic analysis, mm-hmm. BDNF levels are not increased by exercise. But after injury in non-exercise animals, BDNF levels go down dramatically, but they seem to remain at baseline levels in exercise animals. So, so exercise isn't increasing the amount of BDNF in the retina, but it's stopping it from going down. So it's, an, it's a cu- curious finding and something that, that we need to uh, understand better and something we'll be looking at more is, you know, what, what regulates BDNF? We don't know. I was going to ask if uh, BDNF is sufficient. You, you showed it was necessary for the effects you were seeing, but have you tried just uh, increasing BDNF levels? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and no, no, we haven't. Um, there, there are ongoing studies, human studies, looking at CNTF, a related neurotrophin in, in, in Stanford, uh, that are getting some interesting results. Um, but that's certainly something we have to do. As you know, one of the problems with treating with BDNF is that if you elevate BDNF levels uh, exogenously, you downregulate the, the TREC B receptor. Uh, and this yeah. is a problem. For you. So you, you kind of, you get a short response, but not, not a long-term response. Yeah. Another question is uh, from Vincenzo. Uh, he asks, do you think that providing NAM or other intervention locally, like eye drops or something similar, would provide similar benefit than yeah, supplementing that's, that's, NAM? <laughs> yeah, that's a smart question because you know the bioavailability is not great. And 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 so you know we're giving our patients three grams of nicotinamide, which is really a, a, a very large dose. It's it's a dose that's the, the median dose used in in most clinical trials, there's about 150 plus clinical trials ongoing uh, at the moment, but um, it is associated with some gastrointestinal uh, upsets. You need to monitor liver uh, function in patients on those doses. Uh, the standard dose you'd buy in a healthy store would be 500 milligrams. So essentially you're taking six times what essentially most people would say is a recommended uh, dose of nicotinamide. It will be interesting to test the absorbability and then uh, how long it lasts, the kinetics. That's so. Right. And- Mm-hmm. And and another question is uh it's a suggestion like uh not related to exercise per se, but do you know that sleep length and or quality <laughs> which get worse with aging impact the octave nerve function and, and their decay as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I, and I don't know the answer. But what I what I do know is that there's some evidence that sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. Is associated with increased glaucoma rates. A little bit controversial. Some studies suggest yes, some suggest that studies suggest no. But we do encourage patients who've got bad glaucoma, uh, where we can't essentially improve their intraocular pressures anymore, to, to go on to CPAP. There's also some suggestion that the dependent eye may be more at risk. So patients who are habitual side sleepers uh, may get asymmetric glaucoma. And so that's another thing that some 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 doctors are advising is to to, to get patients to change the way they they sleep but sleep quality is really interesting you know I, I i'm sure it is important i you know i don't know how you'd show that um but it'd be very interesting to to to, to investigate that further well, there, there are a lot of devices now that at least per, say that they measure sleep quality rings and watches and things and and uh it might be interesting to look at um just some yeah. uh, measurements from people wearing these kinds of uh, uh devices to see if there's any correlation yeah, absolutely. No, the, the, the difficulty there is the intervention is how, how do you, you know, I guess you can sleep deprive people. And I know some researchers at DPNUS have been doing that, but uh, I think you can only do that in the short term, not the longer term. And I bet, well, Brian, I bet you're a bit sleep deprived today. So, so uh, <laughs> after my 24 like, hours of travel yesterday, yeah, I, I we can measure me. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, there's also another question from uh, Dr. Ivana Haluskova Water. And uh, it's also very close to my heart as well because it, he, she mentioned that uh, the monitoring of the retina might predict various neurodegenerative disease. Would it be usable for the preventive approach? Yeah, thank yeah, you. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And, you know, do, do neurons in the eye that are vulnerable reflect vulnerability elsewhere in the body? In fact, we, we asked this about 10 years ago when we did some, some hearing studies in glaucoma patients. And what we found was that the hearing was, itself was not impaired, but the temporal frequency uh, modulation was impaired, suggesting that their, their, their neurons in the visual visual system and also in the hearing system that, that may be more vulnerable in the, in the same individuals. We also looked at olfaction, which I think is, is down in Alzheimer's disease, 
but did not see any olfactory changes in in, in the glaucoma populations. Uh, but I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, work. Uh, Pete Van Weingarten, who's a researcher mm -hmm. in Melbourne, is looking at using the inner retina in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And they've published some very interesting work um, looking at whether you can actually diagnose Alzheimer's disease from hyperspectral retinal imaging. And I think that's a, again, a, an interesting way, but you know, the, the retina is the only part of the brain that you can see without opening up the skull. So, so I think, you know, it's something that we really should be, be looking at because it may well reflect things that are going on elsewhere in the body, not only the brain, but also in the vascular system, which you can see in the retina as well. Wow, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe one last question. <laughs> have you have you ever looked at the gut microbiome and how it's linked to the <laughs> brain health? Yeah, so so we, we we haven't, but but some researchers have, and and I, I think the, it's fair to say, the, the, as far as I'm aware, and I haven't looked at this recently, but the, the results are a little a little bit mixed, um, and you know the question is whether it's a direct relationship between some of the medications that perhaps some patients are taking uh, yeah. that alters your, your biome or, or whether it's actually a, you know, a, a fundamental association with disease. I, I think it needs to be, be explored uh, more, uh, but I'm not, I'm not aware of the very latest data on that. Mm -hmm. So, so I, the last time I looked at this was a couple of years ago. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we have a, a little bit of time. So this is always dangerous for you because then I can ask you. So give me a give me a future outlook on this. Is I mean, how close are we to really uh, improve therapies and, and things that actually protect the neurons and, and uh, uh, alter outcomes uh, dramatically? So, so I think I think that the two steps to that that question, Brian. The, the first one is you know how can you make the optic nerve more robust and stop glaucoma from progressing. And I think we're close. I think the, the nicotinamide study is, is essentially the second large neuroprotection trial. The first one was on, on memantine, which was done by Allegan about 10 to 15 years ago, sadly didn't reach its primary endpoint. These nicotinamide studies, the four that, that we're involved with, uh, I think are gonna hopefully get a result in the next two to three years and will tell us whether there's an impact. If, if they don't show an effect, I'm, I'm sure other ones will follow quickly. The, the, the challenge is developing clinical trials where you can test these agents in, in a feasible manner. So you know, people aren't going to pay, you know, $10, $20 million for a phase one, phase two A study. And, and yeah. so the reason we've been looking at inner retinal function in the short term was really not to to essentially develop neuroprotectants off the off the bat, but to, to find ways in which you might be able to test them should, should you develop them. So phase one, you know, neuroprotectants to protect the optic nerve, I reckon we're five to 10 years away from, from, from having those. Um, yeah. The second phase will be restoring vision in people, people who've lost it. So replacing retinal ganglion cells or regenerating retinal ganglion cells, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a 10 to 20 year horizon. But I think it's, again, as I said earlier, it's, it's not in the realms of science fiction anymore. So, so I think your, your grandmother, if she's still around in 20 years, I'm hoping we can, we can do something for her and, and try and get her to, to, to help her vision. You know. Yeah, I think you've touched on an important point, which is true with all of these chronic diseases. There's a lot of potential for preventative studies, uh, but they're very, very hard to get funded. And uh, treatments are much more challenging to think about. And uh, that we're struggling with that uh, in the context of a whole range of different chronic diseases of aging. And one of the reasons I keep trying to promote the idea that we need to put the health back in healthcare. We need to focus on people before they're sick and think about strategies that are gonna keep them from getting and progressing in these chronic conditions. And it's just a, it's a hard ship to turn in a, in a medical field where every, not everything, but much of the effort is focused on treating people. Yeah, and I agree because, you know, companies make money from treating people. But, you know, what's interesting in, in the field of myopia, another eye condition also very prevalent in, in Singapore, I've now heard people talking about primary and secondary prevention. So primary prevention will be sunlight, time spent outside exercising, which reduce the progression of myopia. And then secondary treatments are the pharmacological treatments. And I really like that. It's suggesting that the primary intervention is not necessarily a pharmacological intervention. And so, you know, in glaucoma, we could maybe call exercise or diet changes that protect primary preventions and then the secondary ones are the pharmaceuticals. And I think, I think that goes along with what you're saying, Brian. Wouldn't it be great if we, you know, we, we don't first reach for the prescription pad but we actually get people to change their lifestyle to, to reduce their risk of disease and i think that would be a great thing to be able to do sounds great well thank you for joining the show and uh we'll have you back sometime in the future to give us an update 
especially on the nicotinamide studies. I think those will be really interesting. Um, the expanded trials, I mean. I want to remind people to use the chat function and panelists and all attendees option to leave comments and feedback on the show. Uh, we're constantly looking for new members of our team and there's a QR code at the end of the webinar if you're interested in joining the Center for Healthy Longevity. Uh, we had a couple of recent papers in GeroScience last month uh, and both of those are available uh, in links in the chat box uh, uh, at the end of the show. Uh, next week, we, Andrea Meyer will be here and she will have Professor David Dodik, who will be from the Mayo Clinic, uh, and he'll be talking about brain health. So please join us next week. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And I'll leave you with a, uh, a video of heartwarming moments from uh, old people's home for four-year-olds. Since meeting a week ago, 81-year-old Lavinia and 4-year-old Phoenix have become firm friends. Lavinia is my favourite. At the nursery, it's playtime and a chance to enjoy the fruits of their labour. I made it with Lavinia. Who's that? It's Lavinia, I think. Lavinia oh, she... with a walker. Lavinia's mobility scooter cannot cross the grass, but she's determined not to miss out. Oh dear, oh dear. Can't Somebody help. Somebody can... get help, Lavinia. Can't help, can we? Can you... She's a perseverer, isn't she? She is. <laughs> this is like the Sahara Desert. What are you doing? <laughs> the grass is wet. <laughs> you won't just right then. Okay now. Sit inside of me. Come and sit down. Right, okay now. I got stuck in the wet grass. It's so lumpy oh. and wet, but I did it. Uh, you know, I'm determined. I mean, I've got Parkinson's, and um, some people give in, but I won't, they won't let it beat me. And I can't sit doing nothing. I'm still a rebel. I'm feeling like sunshine. Like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down.